time zone you're in. This is Helen Thomas on the CDFM study group. At today's session, we're going to be going over CDFM module two, competency two, the budget and cost analysis portion. We're going to be looking at cost and economic analysis. And so we're going to focus more on the functions of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment who is in charge of the acquisition process. All right. So right on, let's begin on page 225 of the 2020 study guide for the CDFM. As you can see, it begins with the three DOD support systems. So we talked a little bit about this at the last session to understand that every function that the Department of Defense conducts is covered in one of these three circles. You have JSIT, Joint Capabilities, Integration and Development System. You have the PPBE process and the Defense Acquisition Systems. So as you can see the diagram on the top of page five, those three systems overlap to meet <clears throat> the National Defense Strategy. And remember, when we started off module two, the national defense strategy is will meet the national security strategy. So page 225 is reintroducing the three DOD support systems to you. Another thing with the three DOD support system is to remember <clears throat> the way you want to learn them is JSITs first because in the process of analyzing the op order Let's say that the defense strategy was to conduct mission in the central command. Well, then in the JSIS process, the Joint Chiefs of Staff would then do an analytical process where they look at the military capabilities to determine what capability gaps we are missing. So you want to study JSITs first. Because that is where you identify you as the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff and the JROC, Joint Requirements Oversight Council, they identify capability gaps. They look at the .MLPF. When they're doing their analysis, they're looking at doctrine, organization, training, material, leader development, personnel, facilities. Dot MLPF is the acronym. So in the JCIDs, they can determine, is it a personnel issue? Do we just need more manpower? Do we need to change the structure of the organization? Do we need different types of training, different skills? Do we need new aircrafts, new vehicles? Is it a material solution? So if a tri anything other than material is triggered to fill that capability gap, it triggers the PPBE process, plan, program, budget, and execution. Last session, we went over, make sure you know who's in charge of the planning phase, the programming, budgeting, and execution. Planning, <clears throat> USD for policy, programming, the DK. Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation. Make sure you know what the acronyms stand for. Because I promise you, well, at least one of you are going to come back and tell me, oh, they had a bunch of acronyms and I either I remembered or I couldn't remember what they stand for. So make sure you know what acronyms stand for. If it's a material solution that it requires to fill that capability gap, then it triggers the defense acquisition system. So that is how we get to chapter 2.2.5. So you see how the three systems overlap because, again, when you need funding from Congress, you got to go back to the PPBE process for the budget estimate submission. If you need to build something, you do it in the acquisition. If you can't get it commercial off the shelf already, then you got to build it, you got to research, or whatever that process is. That's what we're going to talk about. So the bottom of page five, they started with the PPBE, but again, I say start with JSITs on page six. Identify your capability gaps by looking at the .MLPF. And actually, if you read the paragraph under JSITs, 
almost to the bottom. Let me see. One, two, three, four. The fifth line from the bottom of that paragraph, they're telling you that they're looking at the, doc the doctrine, the organization, training, leader and education, leadership and education, personnel and facilities. That is where I got the acronym dot M L P F. If you want to see it in writing. All right. So if it's a material solution, that means we need new aircrafts, we need new defense <clears throat> travel systems, we need the large scale items, then we need to trigger the defense acquisition system. <clears throat> When you read through that paragraph, what you see, the purpose of the acquisition system, the management of it, the ultimate goal is to manage risk. Everything that you do, there's a risk associated with it. In the study guide, you don't really go into the risk management process, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind, understanding the purpose is to reduce risk. When you read through that same paragraph on page six, the second par set of paragraph, it tells you the three types of risk that you have to manage. You have to manage schedule, performance, and cost risk. That means you're monitoring. Periodically, you're monitoring the schedule to make sure you are on schedule. You want to make sure that they are performing to standard. Or you want to keep the cost manageable. Based on what was approved as the estimate, you want to make sure the actual cost does not exceed that. So schedule, performance, and cost risk. Those are the three risks that are being managed in the defense acquisition system. So they try to find a relationship between capability requirements, what we need, and the acquisition process or even the PPBE process because again they overlap you need funding <clears throat> so they're repeating the process at the bottom of page seven again when you're studying if this is your first time going through the material you need to read it all right so I'm gonna pause at this moment anyone on the phone line have any question of anything that I've discussed this morning Anyone on the phone line? All right, I don't hear any questions. If at any time I say anything you don't understand, you want me to repeat it, please um, give me some feedback so I can pause and make sure you understand. I'm only going to go over part one of this section for today, this competency two, because the same thing like the last couple of weeks, it's a lot of information to cover. So you got to take it in chunks. And then be able to put it all together once you get through the material. So, JSIS, who's in charge of JSIS? The Vice Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. He has the Joint Requirements Oversight Council to help him. The JROC. They help do the analysis. Once they identify the capability gap, they're going to give their recommendation on what it's going to take to fill that gap to meet the national defense strategy, to meet the national security strategy. If it's a PPBE process, you go to plan, program, budget, execution. All I'm doing is recapping, because when you're studying, you cannot just take the page independent that's in front of you. You have to be able to tie all the material together. So repetition, repetition, repetition. All right, so page eight, the overview of the acquisition management process. All right, the next two pages, eight and nine, is going to take me a little bit. I'm going to go kind of slow to kind of help you to visualize what's going on in the process because this is the meat and potatoes for the defense acquisition system, um, the milestones, <clears throat> the phases. When you take module four, for those that go on after you get your certification, you're going to know the ins and outs of what I'm going to go over on page eight and nine. So the phases and milestones of the acquisition process. Any question? All right, let's look at the top of page eight, the overview of the acquisition process. 
because I see a few acronyms you should already be familiar with. We already talk about JCIDs, ICD, and in the paragraph, they don't reference who wrote it. But remember last week, the only instance where the ICD was mentioned, initial capabilities document, was when we talked about the combatant commanders. So the combatant commanders <clears throat> submit their IPLs, integrated priority list, and then once they provide that, that's their shortfalls, what they're missing, what they need, and along with the JROC, determine what the capability gaps are. What are we missing? So in the initial capabilities document, that is the document published by the JROC to document what is required. Let me repeat. JSYS is the first system that we looked at to identify capability gaps. You get the input from the combatant commanders, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they all do the analysis to determine what capability gaps are we missing. What are we missing? What do we not have in our inventory to meet this strategy? The formal presentation of that capability gap is done through an initial capabilities document, ICD. I'm, I'm pointing it out here because I think that's the first place they kind of threw it in there, it's thrown in there, and you kind of will look past it if you're not paying attention or you don't know what you're looking at. So ICD in the first paragraph. So that's what that initial capabilities document represents. All right, so the phases. <clears throat> so the first phase in the acquisition process is the material solution analysis. Remember I told you, during the JCS, they're looking at the .MLPF. If it's a material solution, that triggers the acquisition system. It doesn't mean they go into a full-fledged acquisition process, but it triggers them to look and see what do we need to do on the acquisition side. So let's look at this paragraph. So the purpose of the material solution analysis is to conduct analysis of <clears throat> the courses of action. So whatever the recommendation was on that ICD, we need to determine what capabilities is it going to need to fill that gap. So we need to do, we need some measurements. Key performance parameters, key system attributes. So kind of think of it in your head. If I got a, a problem, I need to fix the problem, but I need to know what guidelines am I going to use to determine what it's going to take to fix the problem. That's all they're doing here. Any question on material solution analysis? We're looking a little bit deeper at what the requirements are to fill that capability gap. <clears throat> In that same paragraph, they mention analysis of alternatives. So for most <clears throat> DOD-minded individuals, you're probably familiar with the term courses of action, right? So that's what material solution analysis represents. You have various courses of action, various solutions that you think will fix the problem, fill that capability gap. And so you analyze them based on the key performance parameters, based on the key system attributes, what they need to be able to do, you need to analyze them. So analysis of the alternative. You're looking at how much it's going to cost, performance, how long it's going to take, and the schedule. So risk. Risk is also reviewed, material solution analysis. <clears throat> After that phase, so what you're going to need to know is exactly the order it is on page 8 and 9. The order in which <clears throat> they occur. So milestone A comes after the material solution analysis. For every after and before every action in the, the acquisition process, there is a milestone decision review. That means the senior acquisition person must review the data and determine what direction they need to take. Do we continue? Are we on track? Are we ahead? Cost overrun? Are we spending more than what we projected? So all those things are reviewed at the milestone. So 
Once the decision is made to go into material solution analysis, they get the data out of there, the, the courses of action, whichever one they recommend, then they move on to milestone A. A favorable milestone A decision approves program entry into the next phase. So before you move to the next phase, there must be a favorable milestone decision. What else? So <clears throat> request for proposals. They're looking for contracts. Let's see what else. A favorable milestone A decision does not, which is important when you're taking a test, is to understand that just because we have a favorable milestone A, they say move on to the next phase, it does not equate to program initiation. That is an important statement for you to highlight. So, material solution analysis, we're looking at the courses of action, we're analyzing them, and we're going to come up with our best recommendation. We move on to milestone A, let the decision maker know what the results were and then they decide what decision which course of action we need to take but a favorable milestone A does not equate to initiation of an acquisition program <clears throat> the second phase is technology maturation and risk reduction phase so even though it's the third step it's not a milestone A is not a phase it's a milestone so don't get confused when they say, what's the second phase? The second phase is not milestone A. The second phase is technology maturation and risk reduction phase. So they're focusing on reducing the technology risk. Remember I told you, every decision you make, there is an associated risk. So for each one of these, it says the purpose of the technology maturation and risk reduction phase is to reduce technology, engineering, integration, and life cycle cost risk. <clears throat> right? So everything we're doing, we're managing risk. So material solution analysis, milestone A, technology maturation. Purpose of technology maturation is to reduce the technolo technology engineering risk associated with that decision. The last part of page eight, it says the purpose of the development of the request for proposal release decision point. So we need to identify at what point are we going to send a request for a contract or request for quotes. Let's put it that way, quotes, because it's not an actual contract yet is to ensure prior to the release of the solicitation for EMD in engineering manufacturing development that an executable program, right? We want to know that someone can build what it is we have on paper, right? Because we can come up with all these great ideas on paper, but can it be executed? So that's what they're saying here is they develop the request for proposal. What exactly are we going to need that contractor to do all right any question on the first three steps of the acquisition process all right i don't hear any steps let's move on the top of page 229 goes into milestone b a favorable milestone b approves which is an important first sentence, approves entry into the <clears throat> next phase, which is the engineering and manufacturing phase. So that's important. And for the responsible component to award the EMD contract. So after the technology maturation, they get the data. Again, the milestone decision authority individuals have to sit down go over the data and they make a decision on what needs to be done so that is the milestone B so a favorable decision is saying yes let's move forward into the EMD phase so the second sentence says milestone B is normally the formal initiation so in the event you're asked where is 
what point is the formal initiation of an acquisition program? It is <clears throat> milestone B. So formal initiation is the word I got out of there, keywords, right? A couple of other things in here, the formal initiation of an acquisition or milestone decision approval of the acquisition program baseline, APB. So that's the starting cost. So understand with programs, you have program managers. The program managers, it is their job to determine what the base cost is for that program. And so your acquisition program baseline is your starting point, that starting dollar amount. So they're also approving that dollar amount, APB. The APB is the agreement between the milestone decision authority, that's the decision maker, and the program manager, and his or her acquisition chain, right? So they can keep track, reporting purposes. No different than what you do at your level. You get approval for a certain dollar amount. You cannot exceed it up to a certain amount. And if you exceed it, you got to get prior approval before you exceed. Still in milestone B, because there's a lot of information in there. Let's see. At this milestone, the MDA will finalize the LRIP, low rate initial production. What is the LRIP? The LRIP is the quantity or scope of limited deployability. What does that mean, Helen? That means if I need a thousand items, I am not going to develop all a thousand up front. I'm going to have a small number. Let's say I develop a hundred because I want to test it first and make sure it does what I expected it to do. And so the LRIP in milestone B is that number, that guideline that says, okay, we need to develop a hundred of these widgets to de so that we can deploy them and we can actually put them in action and see if they actually fill the capability gap. So LRIP, so you got formal initiation <clears throat> of an acquisition program, you have approval for the EMD phase, <clears throat> approval of the acquisition program baseline and you have the LRIP is determined limited deployability so the quantity or scope of limited deployment of that item and following the milestone B review the MDA decision would be documented where do they write it they write it in the acquisition decision memorandum so we like memorandum so that should be easy to remember Acquisition Decision Memoranda. So at each phase, as they're <clears throat> making decisions, it's being, uh, being documented in the ADM. Acquisition Decision Memoranda. All right, let me pause. Any questions? Let me drink some water. <clears throat> All right, I don't hear any questions. We will continue. So that was Milestone B. Material solution analysis, milestone A. Technology maturation risk reduction, milestone B. So the formal initiation of a program begins at the approval of milestone B. All right, engineering and manufacturing development phase. Let's see what happened at this third phase. There are five phases and three milestones. Entry into this phase occurs with successful milestone B decision review. The purpose, so if you notice each one of these, they're telling you the purpose. That means you need to know it, right? It's important. What's the purpose of EMD? The purpose of the EMD is to develop, build, and test the product, right? So in milestone B, we got the approval to move forward. We haven't done anything yet. And now in the EMD phase, we are actually executing. Now we're going to actually build the item. So whether we're building it from scratch or we can take something commercial off the shelf that's already out there and tailor it to our requirements. But all of that happens in the EMD phase. <clears throat> so developmental testing is done and evaluation doing this phase, right? Because we're going to develop it and then we got to test it, right? That makes sense. 
So what I'm trying to do here is to make the information relatable. Because it makes sense. If you're building something new and you don't know if it's going to fill that capability gap. You just kind of look at what you needed to do and you came up with some suggestions and you pick one and then you ran with that idea. So you're doing developmental and evaluation testing. <clears throat> it also evaluates the ability of the system to meet those key performance things that we started off with in material solution, right? Key performance parameters and key supporting system attributes. So all of that is done in EMD phase. The third milestone is milestone C. Milestone C and limited deployment decision are the points at which the program or increment of capability is reviewed for entrance. So again, at the end of each phase, there's a review that or decision point. That's what probably need the word you need to use. A decision point that is held to determine if they can move on to the next phase. So we develop some of the items. We're evaluating them. <clears throat> But at milestone C, we haven't put them out in the field yet. We need approval for that. So milestone C, it gives us approval for production and deployment phase. So that's the key thing for milestone C. And what are we updating in the process as they're making decision? We're updating the acquisition decision memorandum. The next phase is the production and deployment phase, PND phase. So after we get approval in milestone C, we move on to the PND phase. Again, you need to know the order in which these occur and what happens inside of each phase. So all I'm doing is going into the paragraph and I'm just pulling out all the key words of things that happen in those phase. In production and deployment, what's the purpose? The purpose of this phase is to achieve operational capability that satisfy our cap fill that capability gap. Let's remember, we're trying to fill a capability gap. So that's the purpose. At this point, the MDA, Milestone Decision Authority, that's the senior acquisition person, makes a decision to commit the DOD to production at this milestone and documents the decision, again, in the Acquisition Decision Memorandum. So that's all I've already stated. Remember that LRIP number that we came up with in Milestone B, the quantity? Well, if you look at production and deployment, now it says... It enables the program to enter into the ELRIT. Now they can actually go in to produce those limited items. But only after successful completion of another decision review, which is a full rate of production decision review, may the program <clears throat> go into full rate. So LRIP is a limited amount, and then they have to have, once they put those into deployment, they test them, they get the results, then they have another review that's done. It's not a milestone and it's not a phase. So the difference what they did in the 2020 study guide is this full rate used to be up under production. But they kind of pulled it out so you can see it's a separate process. So really you have three milestones, five <clears throat> phases. And then you also have an additional decision review, which is the full rate production. Still on the production and deployment, you have, let's see, we already said that. During this PND phase, the program also achieves initial operational capability, the IOC. What is the IOC? It's a specific date. So initial operational capability date by which you're going to actually produce the items. <clears throat> Milestone C specifically authorizes entry into LRIP for major decisions acquisition programs and major systems into production. So all I'm doing is if you read the words, you see I've already stated that. So when you're reading this paragraph, go in and pull out what's important in that section. All the extra words are fluff. 
But what are they talking about? So production and deployment, that's putting us into operational capability. Now we're going to, we're ready now to put, build the items. We build a few prototypes and we want to now get permission to put them out in the field. That LRIP and that initial operational capability. The next decision point, full rate production decision or full deployment. Although this decision point is, and they even tell you, is technically reached during production and deployment, because again, I mentioned in previous years, it used to be under production and deployment, and technically it still is, but they pulled it out because it's not a milestone and it's not a phase. It is an extremely important decision point. That's what it is. <clears throat> the MDA, Milestone Decision Authority, is to conduct a review to assess the results of the initial operational test and evaluation, OT and E. Right? So once they put the LRIP out there, those limited 100, 100, or whatever that number is, and they test it, then in the full rate of production, I want to review the data. Are we ready to proceed? Are they filling, the end result is, are these items filling the capability gap that we stated in the initial capabilities document? And then the final phase is operations and support. Now we've built the items, we've put them out in the field, now we got to sustain it, right? So sustainment usually is the most expensive because it lasts longer, life cycle. These things last a long time. So what do we see here in operations and support? The purpose of operation and support is to execute the product. We want to sustain, we want to maintain, and we want them to last. We got to take care of them. This phase has two major efforts. We got to sustain them, and at the back end of it, we've got to dispose of the items. Disposal. Right? And we always talk about cradle, beginning to grave, once we dispose of the items. So the same thing here. So part of this process, we're going to look at the life cycle support plan that is prepared by whom? Program manager. So when it comes to the acquisition <clears throat> testing portion of the exam or any acquisition test, if you're not sure what the answer is and one of the answers says program manager, chances are the answer is program manager. Because for most of these, the program manager does all the legwork. So operations and support deals with sustainment and disposal. It deals with the life cycle support plan. The program manager has to come up with the plan in the beginning while they're developing the item of what it's going to take to sustain that item. And then once you de demilitarize the item at the disposal, what are the things that you have to do? Because when, when the life cycle is done with that item, we may get rid of them, we may not use them, but we may also sell them to other countries, our allied countries. But we take off certain pieces of that equipment that's specific to our military. The last part of operations and support says during this phase, the program also achieves full operational capability, fully operational capability, because now we've done that progressive testing, evaluation, we've made some tweaks, we've kept moving through the process. Once you get to the operations and support, now everything, all thousand items that we wanted to develop is out, we're sustaining. If it's a life cycle of five years, then we're making sure that we have those annual maintenance that's done on those those equipment okay so that's the phases and milestone if you know that's a lot of information in there so when you take this piece of it you want to take it first individually you go through the sections but the key to this section is understanding the phases the milestone the decision points and what happens in the order in which they occur <clears throat> so if they, for instance, they throw in, when does the initial operational capability come into effect, you have to know it's production and deployment. So that's why I say it's best to pull out all the keywords, 
next to each. If you're rewriting your notes, milestone B or milestone A, and then under it, just list all the keywords that goes with it, and it'll, you'll be able to remember better. Any question on the phone line? For those on the phone line, if you're on Facebook looking and you have a question that come up, please type the questions, and I promise I'll get back to you later, and I'll answer those questions the best I can. <clears throat> Or I'll direct you to the information. All right, let's look at the top of page 2 to 10. Now, as we looked at those phases of milestone, what page 10 is simply telling you is how do we pay for those things that we're doing? What type of appropriation is used? So if you notice on the chart, their relationship between acquisition and funding, you have material solution analysis, Typically, you use rdt and &E or o and funding, could be used. Technology maturation and risk reduction, strictly rdt and &E funding is needed. Engineering and manufacturing development, rdt and &E and procurement. Production and deployment uses procurement and MILCON funds. Operations and support uses o and and MILPERS. Yes, you need to know that. So the best thing that I tell people when you're studying is go back to page 8 and 9 and in the margins, whether it's to the left or to the right, I like mine written on the left, is you need to write the funding that goes with that phase. So if I go, I'll go back to my page 8 and 9, you can see to the left of material solution analysis, I have RDT and E and possibly O&M, RDT and E. RDT and e in procurement, procurement and MILCON, O&M and MILPERS. Because if you're asked how, what type of funding is used to pay for that particular function at that phase, you need to be able to articulate it. So instead of taking this chart on page 10 by itself, just go back to 8 and 9 and next to each phase write the funding associated with it. Any question? on anything we've covered thus far. All right, <clears throat> so let's see. So everything we've discussed, to include the funding, is covered on page 10. We talked about updating the decision memorandum, and that's mentioned there also. They talk about the different phases, the funding, on page 11, goes back again into the acquisition milestone. And let me see if there's anything in here. So they're just repeating that. Each milestone is a decision point. So if you're asked, what are the different decision points? So I'm reading the paragraph under acquisition milestone. It's like the second to last sentence. Each milestone is a decision point. So if, how many decision points do we have you really have four decision points, right? Because your decision point is milestone A, B, C, and the full rate production, right? So even though it's not listed here, it's one of those and this one. So your decision points are your milestone evaluated by both the JROC, Joint Requirements Oversight Council, so the same individuals that came up did the j -SIDS and they identified the capability gap. They produced the initial capabilities document to say what they think was going to fill it. They're all part of this acquisition process. And oh, let's take it back the other way. Who's in charge of j -SIDS? The vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. Who is the co-chairman of the Defense Acquisition System? Oh, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff is also sits on the Defense Board. So you see how that ties together? Like, ooh, light bulb, poof. <laughs> it's a, I know, I get too excited with this, this information. All right, so that's why the Vice Chairman sits on both. Hey, we identified a problem. This is what's going to take to fix it. And then, oh, if it's not something we can just get funding, get additional personnel, change our... Fan, uh, man in documents, then, oh, I need to also sit on the acquisition side so I can make sure that what we're spending, what we're developing 
will actually continue to meet what we expect it to meet. All right, the regulation, DOD acquisition, <clears throat> on page 12 and 13. If you get guidance from the GAO, it's typically the GAO Red Book, Yellow Book, Green Book. Appropriation, Auditing, Internal Control. If you get guidance from Office of Management and Budget, OMB, it's OMB Circular, A11, OMB Circular. A76. If you get guidance from the DOD, it's typically a DOD directive. So on page 12 and 13, when it comes to the acquisition, the two DOD directives that you have to be familiar with is DOD Directive 5000.01, which goes over the acquisition system as a whole flexibility, responsiveness, so it kind of tells you about the program, and then DOD instruction 5000.02 goes into the actual operation. All those phases we went over, the milestone, those are detailed in this particular um, DOD instruction. DODI, DODI, all of those, same thing, DOD directive. Some information, let me see, it'll come up later, but let me point it out on page 13, under the 5000.02, you see it highlighted. So, <clears throat> who is the senior acquisition person at the DOD level, in charge of acquisition? Who's in charge of the defense acquisition system? So, those are different ways. We talked about it last session. The USD for acquisition and sustainment, USD ANS. So that's what they're mentioning again here. The instruction identifies the USD ANS as the Defense Acquisition Executive. They have different titles. So the USD ANS is the DAE, Defense Acquisition Executive, and another term they'll use is Milestone Decision Authority. So if you look, it says the DAE may delegate authority to act as the MDA. Actually, let's go back. It says the Defense Acquisition Executive is also known as the Milestone Decision Authority, the MDA. So remember I said decision points at each one of those um, milestones and the review point? That MDA, that Senior Acquisition Individual, is the one that's making those final decisions. So at the DOD level, the USD ANS is the Defense Acquisition Executive and he's the Milestone Decision Authority and he's the Chairman of the Defense Acquisition Board. So all of that is the same person. No different than I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a wife, I'm a, I'm a daughter. You have different roles but it's the same person. So let's not get confused. USD ANS, I'm writing a note in my book, is the Defense Acquisition Executive. He's the Milestone Decision Authority. He's the Chair of the Defense Acquisition Board. So that's a few things he's in charge of. All right. And what they're now mentioning is at the component level, each component, Army, Navy, Air Force, they have their own component acquisition executive. So that's what the CAE means. And it'll come into play later because depending on the dollar threshold or whatever it is that they're evaluating, it either will be done at the DOD level or it will be managed at the component level. So each component has their own acquisition executive. That's what the CAE means here. <clears throat> except for, and I think it's written in words, but uh, I'll point it out in page 2 to 13, the service acquisition executive for military departments and acquisition executive and other specified components. Two components, so that's always got an exception, right? Two components, they have their own acquisition executive outside of 
<clears throat> the Army, the Navy, SOCOM, and DLA have been given specific acquisition responsibility. So they do their own approval process. So again, each component, each military department have their own senior acquisition, but the ex exception to the policy is SOCOM and DLA have their own approval for acquisition. All right, so I'll pause again. Any question? And let me see, 1045. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue about a couple more pages so I can get through all of these key individuals, and next week we can actually go into cost and economic analysis. All right, so in the acquisition process, uh, starting on page 14, you have acquisition categories. The categories are based on the type of item being developed or purchased, the cost that's been already designated as a DOD level program or a component program. So I like using the chart. So if you look at the top of um, the charts on page 14, you have acquisition category one. Those are considered major defense acquisition program, MDAPs. Right? Makes sense. Acquisition one, right? Level one, major defense programs. And then each program has subcategories. So the subcategory on the chart on the right says, the, again, USD Acquisition and Sustainment is in charge of acquisition. So he can designate program as either Acquisition Category 1 Delta or Acquisition Category 1 Charlie. How do I know what's the difference? The best way, and they give you an idea here, is the D behind the one delta tells you it's a defense level program. And the C is a component level program. So that makes it easy to remember. So acquisition category one are major defense acquisition programs. Acquisition category one delta tells you it's a defense level program. That means your milestone decision authority is the USD ANS, or it could be an acquisition category one Charlie program, component level acquisition executive is the milestone decision authority. That's just re recapping the information on those two charts, which is listed on the bottom of 14 and the top of 15. On page 15, <clears throat> it tells you again, the DOD component executive and also the two exceptions, the SOCOM and the DLA having their own acquisition executive or responsibility. The next two charts on page 15 goes into, so major acquisition programs are such as vehicles, aircraft, those type of things. Acquisition category 1A the A behind it tells you now it's an automated program, such as the Defense Travel System, DTS, right? Since everybody is familiar with DTS. So that's an information system. So Acquisition Category 1A tells you it's an automated system. And the MAIS, Major Automated Information System Program. So on the right side, you see of that chart on page 15, is... Acquisition category 1AM for the maze and 1AC. So the 1A tells you already it's an automation program. The M is just the acronym for Major Automated Information System for maze. So that's what the M, so the M here tells you it's a defense level program and the C again is a component level. So that's how you look at major defense program, major automated information systems. Who is the milestone decision authority for each? That's what you need to know. I wouldn't necessarily say you have to memorize the dollar amounts for what constitutes an MDAP at the DOD level versus component, but just know the D for the MDAP, the D is for defense, the C is for component. For the ACAT 1A, 
The A tells you is an automated program. The 1AM for Maze is tells you that it is an information system. And the C is a component level. So <clears throat> that's how you learn the difference between those. On page 16, let's see, defense business systems requirements and acquisition. That's straightforward. They mention again the program baseline. Who develops the acquisition program baseline? That's your starting point, the cost, the perimeters, all of that. That is your program manager, your PM. And analysis of the alternative. So they kind of jump around here, but kind of remember when we did material solution analysis and they look at analysis of the alternative. We got a different courses of action and then we review. That's what they're saying here. So it's a re repeat of information you've already seen. So don't get along. So initial capabilities document was that document that the JROC presented to say, hey, you got a capability gap in vehicles. These are the types of vehicles that will fill this capability gap. Let's publish that in an initial capabilities document. There's something I want, before I say it, I want to see it first. Ah, okay. As soon as I thought it, it's on page 17. So as you're going through the process, is you want to know who's in charge of this process. Primary responsibility for analysis of the alternative, right? We're doing courses of action based on things on costs. Who is the senior cost person at the DOD level? The DK, the Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation. So that's what they're recapping, the first thing there. So the DK, we said, was in charge of the programming phase of P. The DK was responsible for updating the future year defense program. That's two things. Now you see that DK is also responsible for preparing and approving the analysis of the alternative study guidance. Right? So they need to know what are my guidelines for my cost analysis. So DK has a lot of functions. So tie it all together. When pause, remember what you already learned, what you already studied, and understand it's the same person. They just have different functions that they're responsible for. So at the bottom of page 17, we'll wrap up here. Let's see. Yeah. We'll wrap up with total system approach. So remember, they don't just identify the gap. Don't worry about how much it costs. How long is going to take to sustain it? How we going? How much is going to cost to dispose it? When you dispose it, are you going to get funding back for it? Do you get paid back for it? Cradle to grave. We consistently talk about that when we talk about a funding document, but it's the same process in the acquisition. So, for example, all hardware, software, admin costs, indirect costs, direct costs, all of those things are considered when they're developing an acquisition program. Alright, so this is a good, let me put my little thing here to remember where I stopped. It's a good stopping point for today. Again, we went over CDFM Module 2, Competency 2, Cost and Economic Analysis. So this is the part one, the building block to kind of get you geared into the other parts of the cost and economic analysis. Remember on the CDFM exams, you will not be able to use a calculator. You will not be able to use pen and paper in most cases. Most cases. If they do, they'll provide it. The test um, provider will provide that for you if you have to do calculation. If in the study guide there's a formula, you need to know the formula. So I'm going to show you ways in how to remember because it's not going to be given to you. The test is not in any order. If it's 80 question, the 80 question can come from any part of module 2 that overlaps with module 1 and module 3. So my goal here is to help you to kind of understand the information that's there and recap what you've already learned in previous modules so that you can see that all the information overlaps. It makes sense. It's just that when you read it in a book, it's kind of hard to visualize. So my goal here is to help you to visualize that process. All right, so we're going to stop here for today. If you have not already subscribed, please consider subscribing to our YouTube page. What it does is gives more visibility on the YouTube platform 
so that they will send out those videos for other individuals to view. So if that's all and no questions for today, this is Helen Thomas and the CDFM Study Group. I thank you for stopping by, and I'll see you guys again next time. Have a great day.